just as a metabolic physician we are always overlooking nafld and and i think nafld is the point that is what is the basic crux of why we are having so many problems so if you don't encompass that in what you are looking as a diabetologist or a metabolic physician that will be a big issue and i think now newer guidelines will be incorporating looking for nafld proactively by the diabetologist and the metabolic physicians so this is something which is very close to my heart because i have already uh, presented many papers on nafld at national and international forums and we did a study at our center and what we found that around 27% of the patients had advanced fibrosis so the incidence is very high the only point is that we are not picking it up so we need to have better systems we ought to rely on the uh, serological markers that we have we should be very cautious when we are seeing these patients because we have to be careful that if you are if a patient of diabetes is presenting with raised serum markers ast and alt values at least that patient or a patient who is overtly obese or having a higher bmi or bigger waist circumference that patient should always be investigated for uh, liver fibrosis and you know that at every stage it is reversible only when you move ahead from nash onwards then it is irreversible so till the stage of nash we can always intervene and what i am telling you that the best modality of treatment that we have available is the lifestyle management so reducing the weight is the best uh, medicine that we have as regards to the management of M mfld now i would not like to call it nfld because it's mfld so whenever you have a metabolic liver disease you ought to think about this so finally they have come thank you very much so it was all as moti sir told me that i had to speak extempore and i think i have proved that i can do a bit of it even without the slides so not moving okay so i started with that nfld is the lost child because non alcoholic fatty liver disease is currently defined as the accumulation of excess fat in the liver in the absence of secondary causes or other liver disease etiologies so nafld or mfld is a diagnosis of exclusion it is the most common cause of liver disease worldwide and is closely linked to type 2 diabetes and obesity so we have to see it in continuum we don't have to isolate so primarily the problem is that basically it is the purview of a diabetologist or a metabolic physician rather than a gastro physician so that delineation is important and lot of cross talk is needed between the diabetologist and the gastroenterologist as regards to this thing and nfld is a broad spectrum of disease states and most people with nfld have simple ketosis with low risk of progression and low risk of liver related mortality or morbidity and the approximately 10 to 20% of patients can develop the progressive inflammatory form that is the nash non alcoholic steatohepatitis and nash is characterized by lobular inflammation and hepatocyte ballooning and i think this is the most important thing because these changes can be picked by biopsy only so the quest is for the right marker or the right thing how we can pick up those patients who are shifting to nash so that is the 100 dollar uh, 1 million dollar question that how do we identify without performing a biopsy as regards to this and despite this large disease burden we there is most people living with nfld are undiagnosed because they are going to the wrong people the right people would be a metabolic physician and the disease course prediction is imprecise and there are no tre treatments licensed for this condition so still lifestyle management is the most important treatment for nfld so not changing okay so basically i'll be discussing this in these headings that is the epidemiology whether it is nfld or mfld what is the pathophysiology and very important is ppr gamma ppr receptors are the most important thing when we are dealing up uh, talking about nfld then what are the medications available with us i have been asked to talk about low dose pyoglutazone so i will be covering that how we have to do that so this is how i will 
structure my talk so as regards to the prevalence globally one out of four adults have excess fat in liver without any secondary causes and in india up to one out of three adults have excess fat in liver without any secondary causes up, up that the incidence is between up around 32% and it is growing at faster pace we are having a boom of obesity 56% patients coming every 10 years so numbers are being added and this is what we did at our center screening for nfld in people with type 2 diabetes so this was the cross section study it was printed and uh, we did uh, uh, the uh, fibro scans to assess the degree advent of uh, fibrosis and we found that the incidence of advanced fibrosis was of 27.2 percent and and the patients with and the and the incidence was 4.9 with a with a fibro scan scores of more than 11.4 so that is very very high and we have to understand that yes we need to rise up to this so this was a basically an eye opener for me also because as a as a practicing diabetologist i felt that yes now it is the time that we should think about nfld also so nfld is basically diagnosis of exclusion so we have to exclude alcoholic hepatitis drug induced hepatitis viral hepatitis autoimmune hepatitis and metabolic wilson and hemochromatosis so is nfld now mfld patients may have more than one etiology affecting the liver at the same time but the current definition of nfld requires that the other causes of diseases are excluded so now the consensus is coming that no we should think it as a metabolic disease the increasingly described synergistic effect of multiple etiologies on disease progression is not acknowledged and recognizing this close association between metabolic risk this international consensus has evolved and what they have found that now we will label it like this the presence of hepatic stosis stosis plus one of the following that is overweight or obese type 2 diabetes mellitus or evidence of two or more features of metabolic dysfunction so this will be the definition of an mfld now on and while this reflects the real world burden by selecting the patients with metabolic factors so this is very important and metabolic associated fatty liver disease acknowledges the potential for more than one etiology of liver disease but may also select patients with metabolic factors that increase the risk of liver progression so we ought to we, are, we have to think now as a broader picture the cardiovascular risk the metabolic profile the the fat in the liver so all these things are to be added up when we are discussing about this so coming to the pathophysiology metabolic inflexibility contributes to dysregulated glucose and lipid metabolism in nfld so overload of high fat and sugar peripheral mobilization of free fatty acids into the into the liver and the ineffective or dysregulated ppr ppr alpha and ppr uh, uh, related uptake that leads to lipotoxic upload and increased deposition of fat in the liver so nfld and insulin resistance may lead to systematic inflammation so we have a, a continuum all across the spectrum and systematic li lipotoxic stress contributes to a cluster of metabolic abnormalities inadequate metabolic substrate dis disposal that is both the glucose and free fatty acids that contributes to the excess free, uh, fat in the liver and this is now what should be the thing liver pancreas and cardiovascular disease so they are all intertwined they are not separate modalities we have to think they are all one so this was what we presented at us endo the correlation of advanced fibrosis and coronary artery disease risk scores in people with type 2 diabetes this was the poster there and there we found that nfld advanced fibrosis was associated with increased risk of coronary artery disease then obesity and insulin resistance are pathogenic drivers central obesity insulin resistance that leads to nfld so again we try to look into this and we had another paper in ada to be to do and what was the correlation of tgsdl ratio and liver fibrosis in people with diabetes tgsdl ratio is a very sensitive marker of insulin resistance and this was presented in ada 2022 so all 
factors we know that genes are contributing to the formation uh, to the progression of nash but the environmental factors are also of great importance that the sedentary lifestyle lifestyle the modern eating habits snacking fast food saturated fats trans fats processed meat meat so all are contributing to it so this is the continuum how it goes multiple things can happen the ketosis increases cytokines are coming in and that is and at the stage of nash the reversibility factor is lost so now coming to what can be done to target this so so if you are having a targets related to insulin resistance or lipid metabolism that we have ptr gamma that is a pyoglitazone glp1 liraglutide semaglutide and number of drugs are being tried to be developed and the targets related to lipotoxicity and oxidative stress again we have got newer drugs with dual ptr uh, ppar um, agonist that is alfibronor and a large number of drugs and alpha and gamma that is the seroglitaz are which is available in india and is cleared by dgci for use in nfld then targets related to inflammation and immune activation then lot of drugs are being developed in that field also targets related to cell death apoptosis and necrosis and then targets related to fibrogenesis and collagen turnover so these are the factors which contribute to the progression advanced age sex race hypertension sexual obesity dyslipidemia ast lt ratio more than 1 low platelets and persistently elevated alt levels so they are all associated with the out, uh, poorer our outcomes as regards to the pro progression of the nash so a few words about the nuclear hormone receptors then only we can understand how pyrimidazone acts so this is a family of nuclear hormone receptors that is a thyroid hormone receptor thr steroid hormone receptors vitamin d3 receptors retinoic acid receptors and the last one is the peroxy 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 so proliferated activated receptor so this is of interest for us that is the pp ppr receptors so if it is effective the signaling is effective then we have increased fatty acid oxidation and the energy burning and reduced fat storage but if this is improper that is the ppr alpha sensing is this is not working properly then we have decreased fatty acid oxidation lipotoxicity so basically the entire thing rests on the ppar receptors so these are the different receptors ppr alpha they are responsible for lipid catabolism and homeostasis control of inflammatory process and vascular integrity so and they increase the fatty acid oxidation at the level of liver then ppr beta and delta responsible for insulin sensitivity and glucose homeostasis and vascular integrity and ppr gamma for glucose homeostasis and liver storage so these are the various drugs which have been developed ppr alpha we have phenofibrate clofibrate gemfibrozol for ppr beta and alpha we have this new drug gw501 516 and for ppr gamma we know all about the pyoglitazone rosiglitazone proglitazone and so many drugs then coming to the medications that we have and i have already told you that lsm is the best drug as regards to the management of nfld and any weight reduction to the tune of 3 to 5% improves statosis and 7 to 10% to do most histopathology including fibrosis and as regards to pharmacological treatment early stage nash at high risk of disease progression age more than 50 years so we need to treat we not we, do, we don't need to treat all the patients those patients who are at high risk of progression to nash are to be considered and patients with age more than 50 years metabolic syndrome diabetes mellitus and increased dlt these are indications for the treatment early treatment active nash with high necrotizing inflammatory activities and progressive nash that is bridging fibrosis and cirrhosis so this is i have included this slide just because that evaluation and management of nfld in patients with type 2 diabetes this is a call of action to all my metabolic physicians and diabetologists present so this is very important that we must address and we must start identifying these patients because this is of great importance so this is the entire schema how it all happens at the level of the molecular label and now we have incorporated the drugs where they are acting ppr gamma agonism pyoglitazone is living at the insulin resistance uh, decreasing the insulin resistance the adipose tissue glp agonists they are reducing weight and improving insulin sensitivity then alfibronor ppr alpha agonism improve insulin sensitivity 
increasing lipid oxidation, SGLT2 inhibitors, lowers plasma glucose by increasing renal glucose excretion, GLP RNA locks, DPE4 inhibitors, and metformin to some extent are useful as regards to this. So these are the guidelines, what they have said as regards to metformin, vitamin E, TPRA, gamma agonists. So drugs approved by regulatory agencies for national certain countries like India, we have seroglitazar, drugs recommended by scientific societies, AASLD, EASL and INASL are vitamin E and pyoglitazone and drugs available for data available but they are not cleared by the regulatory authorities. They are the anti-diabetic drugs, metformin, liraglutide, SGLT2 inhibitors, probiotics, and this new one that is an anti-fibrosis drug that is the ubiquitinic acid. So seraglutazar, we have heard a lot. So it's a dual PPR gamma uh, uh, agonist, that is alpha and gamma agonist. So it decreases hepatic stenosis, inflammation, animal data is there, real life data is there, phase two data is there, histological data is there. First drug approved by any regulatory authority, tried and tested in diabetic dyslipidemia, no major side effects, cost, data not peer reviewed, published as full paper. So there are constraints as regards to this. Then obitocolic acid, bile acid active receptors, farsinoid X receptor, and it controls the bile acid formation. This was used, but a US FDA warning has come as regards to its use because of the increased incidence of pruritus and increased LDL levels. But this is a good drug in F3 and F4 stages of NFLD. Then coming to the pyoglitazone, it improves insulin transduction system, improves glucose transport, improves mitochondrial function, reduces free fatty acids, thereby reducing lipotoxicity. So nth number of indications for pyoglitazone, I think we all are aware about this. Then coming to the topic that is the pyoglitazone and adipose tea, insulin sensitizer pyoglitazone remodels adipose tissue, phospholipids in humans, increase subcutaneous adipose tissue, mass by approximately 3.5% at, at the same time reducing the visceral fat mass. Then pyoglitazone for NASH and NFLD patients with pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes mellitus, a meta-analysis, what it pointed out that pyoglitazone can significantly improve the histological performance of the liver and insulin sensitivity. Additionally, it can significantly reduce fasting blood glucose, glycosylated hemoglobin, plasma STLT and other liver biological factors. So this all started with this particular study and this was the Pyvans trial. This was done by Dave Sanyal and the group. So they compared three groups. One was with pyrotazone, one with vitamin E and one with the placebo. So they found that there was a significant reduction in both alanine amino transferase labels with pyrotazone and vitamin E. But after 96 weeks when it was stopped, so again they came back to the same levels. So it was as regards to both AST, ALT, insulin resistance and weight. So these drugs are to be taken for longer durations of time. Then another interesting study, long term pyrotazone treatment for patients with non-alcoholic steatohepatitis in patients with pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes mellitus. So another study, this was done by Kenneth Pusi and it was presented in the ACP only, that is the NS of internal medicine. And what they found that the, the intervention was all patients were prescribed a hypocaloric diet around 500 kilocalorie deficit and then randomly assi assigned to pyrotas on 40 milli 45 milligram per day of placebo for 18 months and followed by 18 months open level phase with pyrotas on treatment. So the primary outcome was a reduction in at least two points in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease activity score in two histological categories. The results were among patients randomly assi assigned to pyrotazone, 58% achieved the primary outcome, 51% had resolution of NASH, and pyrotazone treatment also was associated with improved in histological scores and improved adipose tissue, hepatic and muscle insulin sensitivity. And the overall rate of adverse events did not differ between the two groups. Then another trial, randomized placebo control trial of pyrotazone in non-diabetic patients with non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So again, this is in non-diabetic patients. So there also they found that there was a significant reduction in the steatosis scores, liver injury score, lobular inflammation score, and water in inflammation score when they compared pyoglitazone uh, with placebo in non-diabetic patients. Then coming to low-dose pyoglitazone. So first we should understand what is the concept of a low-dose pyoglitazone. So this, there are nth number of studies. So this is a study. The effect of low dose 7.5 mg per day, standard 15 mg per day and high 30 mg dose pyrotazone therapy on glycemic control and weight gain 
in recently diagnosed type 2 diabetes patients. And this study was done in India, and it was published in JAPI. And the chart reviews were performed on recently diagnosed less than 24 months type 2 diabetes patients receiving therapy including pyoglitazone, and patients were excluded if they had heart disease or liver dysfunction. So the results were at the end of six months, there was a significant weight gain in all groups from baseline, and the weight gain was greatest in group C, that is 2.72, intermediate in 1.62, and the least in the group A. The difference was statistically significant between group A and C, and group and B, C, B and C, but not between group A and B. But there was no difference between HbA1c lowering in the three groups. And this was the most important thing. And from there, the concept of low dose of pyoglitazone started coming up. So this was further seen in other studies at different parts of the world, that is, Asu et al. did the study. The same results were seen with a low dose of uh, pyoglitazone of 7.5 milligram. So the lowering of HbA1c without having the deleterious effects, that is, the weight gain and the, and the fluid retention was not seen in these studies. Another study by Madhima et al., and this was from Arnoff group, and they also found that all treatment groups, including the 7.5 milligram per day, had significant HbA1c reduction compared to placebo. However, the study showed a significant inverse correlation between HbA1c reduction and weight gain. So then coming to the pyrotazone, even at low dose improved NAFLD in type 2 diabetes. So this is the low dose of pyrotazone in type 2 diabetes. So this was a very interesting trial, and this was a subgroup analysis of TOSCA IT trial. So this was basically for seeing the cardiovascular effects Self, with sulfonylurea vis a vis pyoglitazone. So they did a subgroup study and the objective was to evaluate the effects of one year treatment with pyoglitazone or sulfonylurea or on indirect indices of NFLD in people with type 2 diabetes. And the outcome was one year treatment with pyoglitazone even at low dose significantly improved liver stetosis and inflammation, systematic and adult post tissue insulin resistance in patients with type 2 diabetes. And the beneficial effects of pyoglitazone on NFLD were independent of blood glucose control. So here we have the comparisons, pyoglitazone versus the sulfonylureas as regards to AST, ALT levels, GGT levels, liver fat equation, hepatic stetosis index, and the index of NASH. And HOMA IR and ADIPO IR and VAI visceral adiposity index were also the interesting part of the study was that they compared the three doses, that is the 15 milligram, 30 milligram, and 45 milligram, and they found that all of the, the three doses performed equally well when it came to the regression of the fat in the liver. Then concluding my talk, so pathogenesis of liver fibrosis has, been, has not been fully illustrated. So multiple factors are coming into play. And the repeated heating of the liver, that is the point which is causing the progression from a simple stetosis to steatohepatitis. And pyrotazone, even at low dose, is effective in improving indirect indices of liver stosis and inflammation and systemic and adipose tissue insulin. The beneficial effects of pyrotazone and NFLD were independent of blood glucose control. And an average dose of pyrotazone of 26 mg per day for one year induced a significant reduction of indices of liver stosis liver enzymes and hepatic inflammation. And these effects came together with improved glucose control, a less exogenic lipid profile, and relevantly, without a significant increase in body weight. So pyoglitazone dose is as effective, the lowest pyoglitazone dose is as effective as the highest on the whole metabolic profile of patients with type 2, diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes. And the dose-dependent studies on effects of pyoglitazone on blood glucose control show that even at low dose, pyoglitazone holds its beneficial effects with a re reassuring safety profile, and the liver stosis and inflammation were independent of the blood glucose control. And the pyoglitazone is essentially mitigated by the reduction of insulin resistance, particularly in the adipose tissue. And pyoglitazone, unlike sulfonylurea, is able to contract not only the deleterious effects of lipotoxicity, but also glucotoxicity. And anti-inflammatory and antioxidative properties of pyoglitazone at the hepatic level, but also to its regulatory action on hepatic li lipid metabolism. So these could be the contributory factors that are acting in independently of the glucose control when we are talking about NFLD. So thank you very much.